I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Thomas Mills. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. While many podcasts are funded through sponsors or ad revenue, we at Climate Optimus rely on listener donations to bring you the programming you hear each week. So if you are a regular listener and you value what you hear from us, consider a donation that aligns with that value. Even, you know, $5 a month makes a big difference for us on this end. All you have to do is head over to our website and click the donate button. Well, if you've been following the conflict in Ukraine and the related energy crisis it's been causing for Europe and spilling over to the rest of the world, chances are you've heard hydrogen mentioned among the various potential solutions. And chances are you may have come away with questions like, what are all the different colors of hydrogen? Or where is the hydrogen going to come from? Or how is hydrogen even a climate solution? And you would not be blamed for thinking any of those questions because I think they're all relevant. And so today, we're going to try to do our best to answer them and give you enough info so next time you're out at a party with friends, you can impress them with your hydrogen knowledge. But before we go there, we thought we were overdue for a round of what have you done lately to help the climate. And so, Thomas, I'll put you on the hot seat. What have you done lately? Thanks, Jason. Uh, so last, well, because we're sort of wrapping up winter down here, uh, I've spent the last couple of weekends out planting trees with my nieces and nephews. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's something that we can help paint the picture of what the future is going to look like for them. And hopefully it's a positive future. And uh, so if we have all these oaks and pines that we've put in sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, then that can eventually only be a good thing. So that, and I've just been preparing my garden this morning for plantings for this summer, um, because it's all about getting those food miles down there. Typical food miles in the US for every you know, kilogram of food that you, you purchase, it's typically traveled at least 1500 miles. So if you can grow that locally, that too can only be a good thing. How about you, Jason? You know, maybe I should have gone first. This is going to be hard to follow you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, incremental things, um, getting my commuter bike more tuned up so that I can ride around town and, and do, you know, more trips with it and leave the electric car at home. Also had a number of conversations with people about electric transportation, both electric bikes and electric cars. And I've got at least one person totally convinced that their next car is going to be electric. And so got to follow up with them to, uh, to confirm that they, they follow through, but yeah, had them plenty excited. So Awesome. So fingers crossed. Well, this week, the reason for hope comes to us courtesy of the United States Senate, which might be shocking, uh, where they have ratified the uh, Kigali Amendment. And you may be wondering, well, what is the Kigali Amendment? It's part of a larger agreement called the Montreal Protocol, but it's focused on the phase out of a chemical called of a chemical group called hydrofluorocarbons, which are used in refrigeration. And these Refrigerant gases are extremely potent greenhouse gases, you know, on the order of a thousand times more potent than just carbon dioxide. And the issue is with refrigeration equipment, as things, you know, leak out into the atmosphere, they can cause huge damage. And so by ratifying this amendment, they've joined 137 other nations. And in the big picture, the amendment is forecast to avoid up to a half a degree Celsius of warming by 2050. So it's pretty huge. The good news is the U.S. was already on the trajectory to, you know, cut HFCs pretty dramatically. But, you know, a lot of folks are hailing this because it really sends the message that the U.S. is more serious about climate action and puts additional pressure on on other countries to, you know, to accelerate their phase out of HFCs. Thomas, any any thoughts on the ratification? Uh, yeah, look, I think this is actually massive, Jason. Um, I when, when I'm doing audits on sites, especially dairies, you often come across people using really archaic uh, hydrofluorocarbons that have global warming potentials in the order of 2,000 to 4,000 times. So if you can replace that with a hydrocarbon gas, you know, that, that can reduce that down to a global warming potential of maybe three or four, um, or better still, uh, carbon dioxide actually as a as a refrigerant is fantastic and that of course has a global warming potential of one if it ever ever leaks so hence the reason i'm a huge fan of those sand and heat pumps they've got carbon dioxide as a refrigerant gas and they're amazingly efficient so yes this is a great step in the right direction 
Well, pivoting to our, our main topic, uh, our guest today is Chris Bataille. Chris has been involved in energy and climate policy analysis for over 25 years as a researcher, energy systems and economic modeler, project manager, and, and managing consultant. He is currently an adjunct research fellow at the Columbia University Center for Global Energy Policy, it's a mouthful, and an associate researcher at the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations in Paris, also a mouthful. He was a lead author of the industry chapter of the latest assessment report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change earlier this year, and Chris holds a doctorate in resource and environmental management from Simon Fraser University. So super excited to have him on the program and have him share his, his knowledge on hydrogen with us. Well, Chris, welcome to Climate Optimus. Happy to be here. So to start things off, when you think about efforts to address climate change, what makes you hopeful? What makes me hopeful is that it's not a pipe. We know how to do it. Technically speaking, there are lots of pathways now to to decarbonize all parts of the economy. What it really comes down to now is actually doing it. So you need the policy, you need the finance, you need the supply chain for all the bits and pieces. Um, But pretty well, we can do it for the entire economy. And starting in the early 2030s, basically, we can't build anything that's not that's high emitting or anything more than emitting just a little bit. But that's well within our capability. Yeah, being a technology guy, it's it is reassuring to know that you you don't have to go invent something to be able to you know mitigate a crisis like this. Well, how did you get into your uh, your space of climate and and energy policy? A bit of a serendipitous route. Uh, back in the early 1990s, I was a volunteer for a basically what the equivalent of a Canadian House of Representatives person in our in our Parliament, and he happened to be the the NDP energy critic, and he showed me a paper on climate change. Never heard of it before, and he said, "If you're going to stake your career <laughs> on anything." Let's put it on this. This is the early 1990s. Since then, it's in and out. I've been working in energy basically my entire career, uh, but I help work on models that help predict the supply and demand for energy in the economy, specifically in Canada, but the world and the U.S. as well. Uh, and if you can predict supply and demand for different energy types, you can work on climate policy because that's where most that's where most of the carbon dioxide comes from. Yeah, indeed. Well, you know, obviously we're here to talk about hydrogen. So let's talk, you know, let's start off with kind of what does hydrogen, you know, show in terms of promise as a climate solution? If you can kind of walk us through where does it, you know, fit into this mix of climate solutions that we have? Hydrogen's a really interesting element and bound up with other molecules can do all sorts of interesting things. We already produce and use a lot of hydrogen in the global economy. Uh, we use it for making fertilizer. Uh, basically, 60% of us a lot would be, wouldn't be alive today without ammonia fertilizers, which are made from natural gas and coal. And it's the hydrogen you're trying to get out of there, believe it or not. And it gets made in it gets made into ammonia, then urea, and then to fertilizer. It's used in refining. It's used across the chemical sector. Um, it, it's it's a very very useful uh, element. Now. Where it gets really interesting is it's a very useful complement with electricity. So st- I'm sure on your show before you've talked about electrification with clean electricity. And like the first big tool for decarbonizing the economy is to switch as much stuff as possible to running on electricity and specifically clean electricity, wind, solar, nuclear, what have you. Now, the thing is, wh- when that electricity arrives, say wind and solar, you can't always predict when it's going to be there and, and if it's going to be there when you need it. And what totally. hi- hydrogen does by, by converting, by using it to split water using electrolysis, it allows you to save that electricity for use later, either as energy or a food stock. It's a critical complement with clean, clean electrification in the economy. So, you know, in essence, like I used to build wind farms, you potentially now have a, a wind farm where, you know, you've got excess capacity, let's say, and you're diverting some of that energy with the right equipment to basically crack water into hydrogen. And then you've got that hydrogen sitting there now effectively as a, as a acting kind of as a battery. And then when you need it, you're, you're burning it, I guess, through like a, a gas turbine 
or, or some other equipment to, to generate electricity to supplement when, you know, that, that wind, you know, cools back off or the sun isn't shining. Yeah, exactly. Now, effective, we know by 2030, the efficiency of the various equipment that we use is going to get to the point where you can basically put electricity, convert electricity to hydrogen at about 70% efficiency rate, and then convert it back from hydrogen to electricity at 70% efficiency rate, which means you got a 50% overall turnaround time. Now, that sounds wasteful, but the thing is, if you've got wind or solar electricity coming in, costing you zero, one, two, four cents per kilowatt hour, but you can then turn around and sell it at six, eight or 10 cents per kilowatt hour when people really need it. It's actually quite a, it's quite a business model and helps support both sides of the equation. But we don't, we don't potentially, we, another use for this hydrogen is not just for electricity. It's, it's for fueling, using for fueling fuel cells and heavy trucks and trains. It's for uh, making steel. So currently we make um, most people think that coal and coke and steel are synonymous in their minds, but they don't have to be. The reason we use coke and coal is we got effectively turn the coke into what's called carbon monoxide, and the carbon monoxide is used to rip the oxygen off iron ore, leaving elemental iron, which is then melted and can be made into steel. Hydrogen can do the same thing. So if you prepare the iron ore properly, you can pass hydrogen over it. It strips off the oxygen and you're left with metallic iron, which could be melted and turned into steel. Um, and it's got lots of other potential uses. So, you know, looking at your crystal ball, or maybe it doesn't even need to be a crystal ball. It sounds like we've got, uh, you know, wind and solar projects in the future that not only necess- have like, let's say batteries on site, but they also have, you know, equipment to produce hydrogen. And then that hydrogen can help balance, you know, the grid. It, and then you mentioned steel production, which I know is very carbon intensive. And being able to use it so chemically, it works in in the process that you need to do to be able to create iron ore, which then you you know make into steel. Yep. Are there are there any other applications that are you know kind of showing promise when it when it comes to hydrogen? Well, the beauty of hydrogen is it burns really hot, twenty two hundred C. So wherever we use methane today, you could potentially use hydrogen, but it's going to be a really expensive replacement for methane. And it's actually quite, you don't want to be really leaking hydrogen off into the atmosphere because it does all sorts of interest, interesting and not great things to the atmosphere, just like methane does. Um, I don't know if we're going to be blending a whole lot of, of hydrogen in with natural gas, but at, at given in different industries where you need really high heat, so 400 degrees Celsius heat, 1,000 degree, 2,000 degree heat, you can direct, directly swap out natural gas for hydrogen, obviously at a higher rate because it's got a third of the energy for the same volume and pressure, but it's, it, it's a very, very versatile element. We, we focus a lot on obviously transportation and, and mm-hmm. uh, our, our grid and people are really familiar, but heavy industry is one of those places that can be a really a challenge to decarbonize. And it sounds like hydrogen and its ability to sort of at least partially be swapped for something like natural gas uh, could have real value. Absolutely. And the interesting thing about how I, I, I would argue that we're going to be using clean hydrogen in industry before we're using it in other sectors. Uh, we're first, we're going to clean up our existing hydrogen supplies uh, for fertilizer, for chemicals, what have you. Um, then we'll start use it. We'll probably be using it for steel, for high temperature heat. And when you use it for industry and in, say larger industrial complexes, it's, it's easier to handle. You've got the production facilities, the storage facilities, all the whole vi- voltage wires. If it's from, from electrolysis. Um, you've got the equipment you need to do carbon capture and storage if it's from methane, so-called blue hydrogen. It's it's probably going to be the area where we do it first. And if you've got heavy trucks using it, they could there's a there could be a depot there for them to refuel their mo- refuel before heading off to, to an, another industrial cluster. Some folks hope that we'll use hydrogen as a shipping fuel. Um, it, it could be, it probably will use something like ammonia or methanol to do that because it's a liquid under normal temperatures, but you can make both from from clean hydrogen. In the longer haul, I see hydrogen as being a a critical 
building block along with clean carbon and clean oxygen for making what I call synthetic fuels, synthetic gases and liquids. So, you know, in the long haul, hopefully we're running in the very long run, we're running everything on electricity and hydrogen. But in the medium term, there's a whole lot of industries. There's a lot of buildings that run on natural gas and it's not cheap, but you can literally make methane out of one uh, carbon atom and four, uh, four hydrogen atoms. You put them all, put them all together and you, you create synthetic methane, which then can then be used in buildings or what have you. Now it's, it's not an ideal solution. If it leaks, it's still methane, but it does give you a climate neutral fuel um, for the, those intermediate intermediary uses. So, you know, we're talking about hydrogen in applica- like transport related applications. Where do you see, you know, people are obviously very familiar at this point with uh, electric vehicles. Where do you see, you know, something like, you know, uh, batteries being sort of the, the energy storage for a, a transportation uh, application in a car? And then, you know, where do you see hydrogen fitting in? Like, uh, no, it's a good question. And I don't know if there's a cut and dried answer to that because it's changing all the time. The batteries keep getting better, what have you. But the advantage hydrogen operating through a fuel cell house is it's a much, much shorter refueling time and a lot of power in a smaller, lighter package. Uh, so if hydrogen is used in he- in heavy freight and in rail, it's going to be in the long distance routes. Like in Europe, their rail system is largely electrified. So those, these things lift up, they touch the wires and they power the trains on the electrics and the wires aren't there. The things come down, they run on diesel. You could easily have a hybrid train, which is have part fuel cell and part battery. So you've got a fairly large battery and a fuel cell and the fuel cell could be used to top up the battery. But that same logic could be applied to heavy tra- trucks. So say on big highways, there's a, you know, a thing that lift, it's called a pantotherm, lifts up, touches the wires, keeps the truck going, uh, you know, it's saving the hydrogen. But then when you have to get off the major highway and there's no overhead wires, the pantotherm drops, you go on to the fuse cell or existing batteries and you keep on going. And a lot of places you won't be able to put high wires up. So, you know, crossing the North American continent, crossing Asia, what have you, crossing Australia, we're not going to have overhead wires there. So fuel cells would be probably critical in that case. And the IEA is projected that anything operating over roughly 400 kilometers between refueling stations is probably going to end up being hydrogen fuel cell. But, you know, there's going to be a whole thing. And there's nothing to say that a tractor trailer or a train or what have you can't be both hydrogen fuel cell and batteries because the underlying motors are all driven by the same chassis. It's an electric motor chassis that's either fed directly from a battery or it's fed from a fuel cell. It's all still electric. It's just It, it just changes depending where the electricity is coming from. And you could different mixes. Interesting. So really, you know, kind of ability to complement one another given, you know, the the different kind of applications. And it sounds like there's obviously still kind of this race in terms of, you know, what where will we finally land in terms of, you know, battery chemistry and and range and so forth. But it sounds like hydrogen when you're a long haul truck driver and you're trying to maximize your time on the road. Um, and you're having to fuel obviously a much bigger tank. Uh, it sounds like hydrogen is a is a is a better option because you're able to refuel much more quickly. Yeah, that's the way it looks today. But we'll see how the technology evolves. So some people may have heard, you know, in in the news about kind of different hydrogen colors. You know, hearing about things like green hydrogen or blue hydrogen or brown hydrogen. I, I'm wondering if you can kind of walk us through the basics and we'll, we'll stick to maybe the basic colors. Cause I've heard there's a whole array out there. Oh yeah. The, the, the color wheel is just, it's getting confusing to be honest. Um, the one you do have to, okay. The one we don't talk about, but what people should be aware of is it's called black hydrogen, which is hydrogen made from coal. And that's actually more common than that we'd like. And it happens across much of Asia because they simply don't have natural gas to work. Um, gray hydrogen is when you, you break apart methane to get to separate it basically into hydrogen and effect and CO2 effectively. And that's the most common way hydrogen is made. Now, if you can capture the CO2 coming out of either black or gray hydrogen, and at a 90, you know, at a fairly high level, 90 plus percent, that becomes blue hydrogen. Now, blue hydrogen, people argue back and forth about it, but it's, you know, if black and gray hydrogen are about a dollar a kilogram, blue hydrogen is probably a dollar fifty to two dollars a kilogram. 
The next color, which is green, which is when you're splitting water using electrolysis to get hydrogen and oxygen, is more like about four or five to six dollars a chemical kilogram minimum, if not more. Wow. Right. So that's so like threefold that's, at least. That's the cost spread we're working with today, which is why, like, wh you know, why would you bother with blue hydrogen? Because it's a lot cheaper um, and it's likely to stay cheaper in places with cheap methane and good CCS geology. So the entire east slope of the Rockies from the Yukon to Mexico, like passing right through Canada and the U.S., those are all places with lots of cheap methane and lots of really good CCS geology. And there are places like the Middle East is like that. There are parts of Russia, parts of Australia, where blue methane, sorry, blue hydrogen is going to be a lot cheaper than green for a long time to come. However, if you're in a place that has really good sun access to and access to water, uh, specifically, you, if you can make electricity for less than two cents per kilowatt hour, then green is going gen, green is going to start becoming cheaper than blue as as a cheap as a clean hydrogen source. Um, again, the Middle East, <laughs> Australia are double blessed. Um, a lot of a lot of the Southwest U.S. has those kind of quality, really strong sun. South Africa, um, places just with really good sun can make that kind. But in order for us to get to, right now, even those places would be four to five dollars per kilogram to get down to two dollars a kilogram equivalent to blue. You need electrolyzers to cost to fall in cost by half and you need to get that electricity down to two cents per kilowatt. Uh, after that, there's um, there's I think it's turquoise is when you do pyrolysis of wood. Uh, there's, uh, I'm not sure if that's, uh, there's one that's nuclear. If you're using nuclear heat to split water, uh, okay. that's one color. Then there's, if you're bad gasifying biomass, that's another color. And it just goes, and then it goes on and on and on from there. So uh, recapping to make sure I'm tracking the basics, you've got black and gray, which are coming effectively both from fossil fuels. But in, if you're capturing the carbon uh, that's emitted in that process from either creating hydrogen from coal or from natural gas, then it becomes blue because it's no longer you know, contributing to, to climate change. And then green hydrogen, in essence, is going to be produced via you know, renewable energy where you've got really, really cheap renewable energy and access to water. But it sounds like the economics are still very much in favor of blue hydrogen approach. Yes. Oh, and, and one other clarification. You mentioned you know, places like, let's say, the, the Rocky Mountains might be ideal for blue hydrogen. So that's, you know, they've got let's say, access to good, when you say methane, most folks might know it's like natural gas resources, plus the geology is such that you said uh, CCS, so carbon capture and storage. So they're able to, they've got feedstock, they need to produce the hydrogen, and they've got the place to put the CO2 once you've finished the process. That is exactly it. So on the east slope of the Rockies, where it turns softer, flatter, literally from the Yukon all the way to Mexico, right? It's one continuous mountain range. There used to be a sedimentary ocean there, an ocean back 60 plus million years ago. So it was a fairly shallow, lots of plants, dinosaurs, sea life, what have you. All that stuff settled to the bottom. And that's where all the oil and the coal, oil and gas comes from that much, that much of North America, Mexico powers itself on. Wow. And underneath that is a deep saline layer with basically infinite capacity to store carbon dioxide. So, so super interesting. Lots of lots of promise. Um, you know, may take folks a, a minute to kind of put together all the steps in the process. But regardless, hydrogen you know has a lot of potential value as we're looking to decarbonize. What what are really the barriers? You talked a little about cost, but what are the barriers to it being able to to scale up? Hydrogen is like when think about it, it's the intermediary, right? The you need an end use, like moving things in trucks, um, heating things in industry, what have you. You need demand, like demand willing to pay, and that you need investment on that side in all the equipment to consume the hydrogen. So people buying fuel cells, buying burners, all that kind of things. So, but before people will invest on the demand side, they have to know their supply and supply right. at a reasonable cost, <laughs> right? <laughs> and people won't supply unless they know there's demand. So you. Have this chicken and egg problem is you're you're, you're having to create an end the only place where we know there's demand today is in refining uh making fertilizers uh and ma basically making chemicals one way or the other 
right? So we know we can do it in there, but in order, like if you're going to supply hydrogen for freight trucks, someone's got to sell and buy those freight trucks and the hydrogen has to be available for them. So you need this stepwise supply and demand building that allows all these things to happen. And that's really the single largest problem, the single largest challenge. You need a production equipment, you need a distribution network. You need, all these trucks need to know where to go to get the hydrogen and what have you. And that's, that's literally building an industry almost from nothing. Interesting. So have we seen a similar place where we've had this kind of chicken and egg scenario where we knew we had a potential solution, but you got both sides kind of doing the dance and not sure when to you know, take the first step? No, that, that's a trillion dollar question you're ask, actually asking right there. The way I see this happening is that it's the, the use of hydrogen. We're going to start replacing our existing black and gray just for climate policy reasons. We're going to build out the capacity for the carbon capture and storage for blue, which means we're going to get some familiarity with the storage and handling. And you get, you know, industrial clusters that are near CCS geology, usually seaports. So Galveston, Texas, that whole chemical corridor in there, uh, Rotterdam, Teesside, Bergen. These are all big seaports, seaport industrial cities with refineries. Uh, often there's a fertilizer make there, maker there as well that can make use of the hydrogen. We'll start with blue, it'll start to add green production. You know, so you see these industrial clusters as being the beginning. Outside of those seaport industrial clusters, I see steel as being the uh, the big opportunity. So that to me is how it, it won't start with trucks. Trucks will be an outcome of the building of these of these hydrogen enabled industrial clusters. So you know, clearly lots of promise with hydrogen. Um, be exciting to see how things unfold. If we, you know, if, if individuals are, you know, excited by what, by what they're hearing, how could we help kind of affect this change that needs to take place, right? This, this scaling up. That's a, that's a really good question. The hydrogen, to my mind, is going to be mostly something handled by professionals at industrial clusters, used by big companies, what have you. But it's part of a broader system of decarbonization is going to happen that people actually have a really big role to play in, right? So, you know, today, you know, the average individual owns a gasoline or diesel powered vehicle, has a natural gas furnace, you know, they might, they might fly somewhere, what, what have you. The first very short run thing they can do is just think about their driving, just you know, drive, don't worry about it, but just try to minimize the number of trips. And when you're, when you're business flying, can you do a zoom call instead? If you own a house and this is, you know, this is, there's a lot of equity questions at play here, but if you own a house, th think about putting an induction stove, put it, put in a heat pump. If you live in a colder climate, it might need a boost fuel of some sort. Maybe someday we'll have bottles of hydrogen on the, on the heat pumps that help us boost them. So they operate in any temperature. Think about solar panels on your roof. Think about insulation in, in, in your building. Those are the things people can make a really big impact if they can if they can afford to do it. Um, you know, in the long haul, you'll you'll get an option someday if you go to buy a car in the late 2020s, early 2030s, where it might be branded green steel, and you know it'll cost maybe 100, 200, 300 dollars more. And I brag to your friends, you got green steel in your car. It's incredibly nerdy, but I would do it. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, and support, you know, whatever your political stripe, support politicians that do support strong climate policy, because, you know, no matter what happens, we're kind of all in this together. Like we're, we're going to be here as senior citizens, our kids will be senior citizens, and then our grandkids will be senior citizens. And we want to live them a livable planet to work with. So. Yeah. Again, you know, we tell folks that uh, politicians hearing from constituents, that old fashioned phone call or, or, you know, these days maybe email can actually make a difference. Well, thanks for coming to talk to us about hydrogen and, and all the promise it has. Yeah, fingers crossed we see some of these cool projects popping up in the future. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So what did you uh, think of the, the interview with Chris? Uh, well, I, I think it was an amazing advertisement for the electrification of society in general. Um, I think the, the takeaway, main takeaway for me is that whilst hydrogen has a place, it's going to be in the more industrial applications. But for the rest of it, you know, things like heat pumps and electric vehicles versus hydrogen vehicles are going to be the solution because their round trip efficiencies are typically so much higher than a hydrogen based solution. How about you, Jason? 
You know, so the first thing I'll say is that even as a big engineering nerd, I think the topic of hydrogen can get complex quickly. And so the conversation with Chris was really helpful to, to clarify, you know, my understanding. And I really came away thinking of it as a, as a climate solution in two ways. You know, one, as this ingredient in these industrial processes where we have the opportunity to move away from, you know, gray and brown hydrogen to blue and then hopefully quickly to, to green. And then secondly, thinking of hydrogen as a, as a fuel or energy storage medium that can be used in, in power generation or transportation. And, you know, like you, while I'm skeptical how big of a role it's going to play in backing up, you know, wind and solar where batteries have already taken off, in the case of, you know, long haul trucks, things are clearly still up for grabs. I mean, you have manufacturers that are releasing, you know, models that are fuel cell electric that run on hydrogen and, you know, battery electric. And so it's going to be super interesting in three or four years or five years to see how things shake out and which, you know, which technology really wins the race. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, some of what goes on in the hydrogen game is, is sort of there to keep the existing fossil fuel infrastructure afloat. There are a number of regions around the world that looking for up to 20% uh, insertion of hydrogen into those existing um, methane gas pipelines. But at the end of the day, like we, we can't be looking for s relatively small incremental changes. We need massive step changes. And that's the beauty of going from combusting gas to running a heat pump in a house. You, you've achieved a 400% efficiency gain. And, and so little baby steps are, are not adequate now. That was like, it's, that's the kind of thing that we should have been looking at you know, 10, 20 years ago. Now we need significant change in a relatively short period of time. So let's save the hydrogen for the applications such as the high, high temperature heating applications or the creation of green steel where we don't have other solutions right now. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, you look at the fact that we are already using hydrogen in many industrial, you know, processes, you know, we need to be focused on swapping that out with, with green hydrogen. And in the case of steel, it's folks might know that steel production is carbon intensive, and the reality is it's it's about seven percent of global emissions. Uh, and so, being able to move to something like hydrogen and and away from coal, you know, for the process of refining the steel, it is a big deal. You know, I thought I would share with folks. There's actually a you know a partnership called H2 Green Steel, and I'm sure it's not the only one out there. But they're in the process of developing a plant right now that's supposed to come online in Sweden in, in 2026 and would rely completely on green hydrogen um, and enable us to you know, be making that green steel that we desperately need to be able if we're going to cut our, our emissions in that sector. Yeah, I, I think another thing that we should possibly look at too is like a lot of these applications where we're using black or brown hydrogen today, like are they, are they really processes that are let's say necessary um I, I take one for example is that the, the massive adoption of ammonia-based fertilizers in uh, industrialized agriculture as, as soon as fertilizer prices will hear that's gone you know from three hundred dollars to about thirteen hundred dollars a ton because of the situation in U ukraine all of a sudden farmers are asking the question well i didn't need it in the past why all of a sudden have I got addicted to this stuff? And maybe there's a way of getting it out of the atmosphere for free, like I used to using, you know, nitrogen fixing plants. Yeah. I mean, that was on my, my list of things to, to mention as well. It's like, we got to still remember holistically that, that energy efficiency is the greatest tool of all. And, you know, it costs less. And, you know, when we start thinking about the number of what you're talking about, you know, wind turbines and solar panels to produce electricity or wind and solar to produce green hydrogen, it's massive. And the best thing we can do, to your point, is is start finding ways to cut back on these products in the first place, whether that's fertilizer use or, you know, reducing our electricity demand by better insulating our houses or installing things like heat pumps. So, yeah, it, you know, it's great to know that we have the technology out there and it's available and that, you know, enables us to move away from fossil fuels. But we also have to remember that the, the best solution of all is reducing our energy demand in the first place. Yeah, and I think your comment on efficiency is probably a good segue into um, you know, the round trip efficiency associated with hydrogen versus the alternatives for sustaining 
uh, grid voltages during periods where there is no wind or no solar. And, you know, the alternatives really are like batteries at around 90 plus percent round trip efficiency or pumped hydro at 80 percent round trip efficiency. So, you know, when you're talking realistically, maybe 40 percent round trip efficiency for hydrogen, it's it, it means that you've got to have twice the generating infrastructure available. And um, that doesn't, it's not free, right? None of this is free. It, it all takes resources and time to manufacture and emissions to manufacture. Yeah, I think the thing that's exciting to me is that, you know, when we look at the electricity side of things, you know, we know that wind and solar are much cheaper now, and we know that batteries have come down and, you know, fill an important void there. And I look at hydrogen as, as something that, you know, it's, it's another option that enables us to maybe backstop if we need it. But, you know, at this point, let's let the economics decide. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Jason. I think let's, let's use it where it makes sense. Let's not waste it on applications where it doesn't. So it's a good segue to the question, as always, what, what can we do? And, you know, I think as Chris pointed out, um, you know, we'll all cross our fingers Hydrogen, you know, moves quickly in the industrial side, but it's not something that we ourselves uh, are going to be driving a whole lot. Um, but as he did point out, you know, moving to more efficient devices in our homes is something we can definitely do. And, you know, here, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, we're headed towards winter. So if you're in Europe or the U.S., it's a great time to start thinking about, you know, how do you better insulate your home? You know, can you move over to something like a gas furnace to a heat pump, you know? Do you need to put in new windows? And, you know, the good news is here in the U.S., uh, we have a lot of great incentives that are going to be available, you know, starting January 1 of 2023 with the Inflation Reduction Act. So start thinking about those upgrades that maybe you've, you know, tossed around before, get get the quotes from your contractors and, you know, and start moving forward because we all need to do our part to reduce our energy demand. Any additional recommendations there, Thomas? No, I, I think now is just time for action. Let's let's get at it. Let's get ready to rock and roll on January first. Well, that's uh, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Uh, thanks as always for tuning in. Come back next week when we'll be digging into the U.S. election and its implications for the climate. Climate Optimus is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimus.co, and don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimus Podcast. Oh,